Fella, what are you still doing here? Waiting for these quotes, and they just came in on the telex from Brussels. Anyone ever tell you that you're too efficient? Certainly not you. It's late. Go home. I will. Good night. Oh, uh, happy birthday. Whether you like it or not. See you Monday. Bye. Name, Mr. Gordon. All right. Attack for my birthday? Happy birthday, Mr. Gordon. Thank you, Mrs. Jeffries. Will there be anything else? I hope not. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> Did you make a wish? <laughs> no. Father, here's to your next 60 years. Well, don't be so pessimistic, David. I was being sincere. So was I. Well, my heart certainly belongs to Daddy. Thank you, my dear. Mine, too. <laughs> Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Here, here. Thank you, all of you. Well, now, I would like to propose a toast. I'd like to propose a toast to all of us. This is a toast to change. What sort of change? Profound change. I'm cutting you all out of my will. 
You're joking. Papers are being drawn. All you ever gave us was your money. You can't do this to us now. I should have done it long ago. Now, whatever you have left in your trusts, that's all you get from me. Now, children, you'll, you'll learn to take care of yourself. The money you would have inherited will go into my foundation. So that she can manage it? No, I'm, uh, I'm removing Paul as head of the foundation. Why? My foundation was never designed to be an extension of your social life. And with the infusion of new money, I'll need someone who's actually capable. Adela Street will be the new administrator. Is this her idea? It's getting late. A few uh, overseas calls to make. It was very nice of you all to drop by. Appreciate the thought. Good night. This is some surprise party, all right? Afraid you're gonna lose your free ride? Why do you? Chris, David, will you stop it? Don't worry, Laura. He won't divorce you till he spent the last of your money. Control yourself, David. After all, it isn't Chris's fault. He hasn't had as many chances to fail as you have. And why did you marry our father? For his sense of humor. Absolutely. Joke's on us, isn't it? Well, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm going to go home and see if I can balance my checkbook. Go. You're telling me. Excuses. No, I, I don't want to hear that. Phil, listen. I've got Defense Department auditors all over me. Now, if I don't get those transponders by Tuesday, the deal is off. Right. Call me. this murder if you get past me you're home free
Arthur Gordon, founder and president of Arthur Gordon Industries, one of the West Coast's largest and most successful computer science companies, was found stabbed to death in the study of his Pacific Palisades mansion late last night. Members of the family have been arriving at the estate since early this morning. Police have not been forthcoming with any details regarding the murder, except to say that no arrests have been made. We will be bringing you further details on this story throughout the day. Gordon, I'm Lieutenant Cooper. This is Sergeant Stratton. I'm sorry about your husband. Thank you. We do have to ask you some questions. Mrs. Gordon wants to cooperate. I'm Kenneth Braddock, Mr. and Mrs. Gordon's attorney. Mm, this way, please. The rest of the family is giving their statements in there, uh, please. So, uh, what can I tell you? Evidently, the assailant knew the security codes of the house as well as the electronic gate. And so? So we have to ask everyone who had access their whereabouts last night. Where were you? You don't have to answer that. Uh, perfectly all right. I was uh, staying in an apartment we own in Century City. Were you alone? Totally. Any particular reason why you were there and not here? I often stay there. You're not the mother of these children, is that correct? Fortunately, they are his by his first marriage. Mr. Gordon's first wife passed away some time ago, Lieutenant. Did you and Mr. Gordon have any children? None. You recognize this earring? No. Should I? It was found in Mr. Gordon's hand. Apparently came off during the struggle. Apart from yourself, Mrs. Gordon, and the housekeeper, and uh, the children, of course, did anyone else know the security code? Yes, Mr. Gordon's executive assistant, Della Street. Hello? Yes, this is she. No. Yes. Yeah, I'm still here. Uh, of course. I'll be right there. changing. Oh, Paula, I... Della, Paula's taking it very hard. Where would you like to go? Somewhere nice for lunch. And just how long had you worked for Mr. Gordon? About eight years. In what capacity? I originally worked for Mr. Gordon as his personal secretary. And then about four years ago, he made me his executive assistant. You got along? Yes. Why? Oh, I understand he was a difficult man. He could be. Where were you between 11 p.m. last night and this morning? Home? Alone? Recognize this? Yes. I believe it's mine. When was the last time you wore it? Maybe two weeks ago. I have a habit of taking my left earring off when I use the telephone and... As a result, I sometimes lose it. Where did you find it? In this room, 
You don't own a dress made of this material by any chance. Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, I do. Street, we'd like to look around your house. Of course, we don't have a search warrant, but I could get one if necessary. If it won't be, I have nothing to hide. I don't understand this. I, I brought that dress back from the cleaners just yesterday. Found these in the other closet. There's mud on them. Helen. You shoot this? Lieutenant, someone is obviously... I just found this in your trash can. It can't be mine. Straight, I'm afraid you're going to have to come with us. I hope you have a good attorney. You have a right to remain silent. If you give up the right to remain silent, anything you say can and will be used against you. You have the right to speak with an attorney. This morning, I've been trying to think who should represent you. The best man I can think of is me. Since when are appellate court judges permitted to represent defendants? They're not. You'd have to step down. I signed my resignation. Della, let's say I got tired of writing opinions. Every signature can make them one like a lifetime, all right? Okay, that's very important. Now, you hang on that trial. Look, get Carl off the singer case. If you have any, in a moment, any problems, get back to me on that, okay? Okay, okay thank you. Thought I'd come straight to the prosecutor. Good to see you, Perry. Sorry about Bella. If you're here to talk bail, I'll have to include the deputy who's going to prosecute. Better call him. It's not a him, it's a her. Times change. Barbara, will you come in here, please? You surprised a lot of people when you stepped down from the appellate court. I suppose I did. Barbara. Barbara Scott, this is Perry Mason. So it is. How do you do? I do pretty well, and we all know how well you've done. I'd like to have Miss Street released on bail. Willie, I assumed you were here to cop a plea to a lesser charge, say, murder two. I came here as a professional courtesy to ask your concurrence on setting bail. We concur. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, you may have some potentially damaging circumstantial evidence, but you're missing something very important. You don't have a motive until the hearing. I'll be there, Counselor. Good seeing you again. Goodbye, Perry. Miss Scott. This is going to be fun. Colorful. Granted, it would be a little more satisfying if he were still at the top of his game, but he's still Perry Mason. Rusty or not. You're that confident. Jack, this is a dead bang winner. You know how many times Hamilton Berger said that? 
Miss Street, how do you feel about having Mr. Mason as your attorney? Mr. Mason, can you comment on the prosecution's case against Miss Street? When do you expect to go to trial? Answer to your questions, no comment, no comment, no comment. But you can quote me. Hello. Yeah, it's me. Yeah, I got a good reason for calling you. You never told me that Perry Mason was going to be her attorney. You knew all about her. Who'd you think she was going to get, Nixon? I'm saying that you should have told me, okay? I'm keeping an eye on him, that's all. I see how someone could have gotten in. How's that? This window was painted shut. Looks like someone used your gardening trowel to force it open. You'd think the police would have noticed. They're not looking to prove that someone entered your house and replaced your shoes and dress with ones worn during the murder. Whoever it was had my earring, knew what dress and shoes to buy. It's eerie. How often was the security code to Gordon's house changed? Every two weeks. Tell me about Gordon's relationship to his family. It wasn't exactly a Norman Rockwell portrait. Mr. Gordon's first wife committed suicide, and his three children were either terrified, resentful, or both. What about his current wife, Paula, isn't it? Mm-hmm. They've been married 10 years, but they weren't getting along. Mr. Gordon, about a year ago, banished her to his penthouse apartment in town. She didn't like me. Felt threatened by you? I suppose so. I'm curious, Della. How did you get along with a man like Gordon? It wasn't always easy. He was, he was tough. But if he liked you, respected you, he was fair, very loyal, even generous. He was the best at what he did. But uh, I guess I was used to that. You spoiled me. As always, this is terrible. <laughs> As always, you flatter me. I don't have to tell you that we've very little to go on. I know. We're going to need a private investigator right away. Paul Drake? I haven't seen him since... Fourth of July, you both came up to San Francisco that weekend. How is he? Oh, he's fine. Just wonderful. She seems to be doing okay. I already talked to a contact of mine downtown, and I think I can get into the property and sneak a look at the evidence. It might take a little finagling, but I think I can do it. 
you play here often? Well, I sit in with these guys now and then and uh, let off a little steam, make them sound good. Do we have a date for the preliminary hearing yet? Not yet. How's the Drake Detective Agency these days? A little bit more my style than my father's, but uh, I'm doing fine. How many operatives do you have? One. One beside yourself? No, just one, me. What happened to the others? I decided to reduce the overhead. Last time I saw you, you were working on a novel. How's it coming? I'm about halfway through. Give or take a chapter. That's what you said last time I saw you. Why am I getting a third degree here? As we're talking about Della's life, I need an experienced investigator. Check, please. I'll get it. I am an experienced investigator. Paul, I worked with your father many years. I've known you all your life. I know you're smart, and I'm sure you're good. But I don't know if you're ready for this one. Sorry to be blunt, but it's the way I feel. I'll talk to you soon. sax now and then. Sherlock Holmes had a violin. I like to write, so did Dashiell Hammett. All I'm saying is, I run my life and my business to suit me, but I am quite capable. Now, my lifestyle might not click with you, but Della means too much to me. I'm not taking no for an answer. I'm working this case. Meet me tomorrow. 11 a.m., your office. Be on time. get here before Perry showed up and tidy up a bit. What's the problem? Seems I recall your father keeping this place somewhat neater. Huh. <laughs> How you doing? Couldn't be in better hands. Perry's got me on a short ticket, you know that. Don't let him get you down. No, he doesn't get me down. Perry's kind of like my Vince Lombardi. He motivates me to complete the 80-yard pass of life. Are you handling this as well as you're coming across? I'll let you know. What is all this? Ah. Mm -hmm. This is my work. This is what you have in your hand. Steiger case, Kaplan versus Kaplan. Ricky Steinmetz versus the Casa de Campo Apartments. Not exactly crimes of the century, but they pay the bills. And uh, what's this? This is the shut-off notice from the phone company. Good morning. Give me a couple of hours and you won't recognize this place. I don't recognize it now. Preliminary hearing set for next week. We don't have much time. I'm available. Good. Let me fill you in. Oh, went downtown this morning. And went over the police report. There's a copy for you. Also spoke to a friend of mine on the force who was on the investigation and I did manage to get him to give me a look at the physical evidence. Here's an itemized copy of everything they're holding in property. So, unless something new is broken in the last 20 or 30 minutes, I'm up to date. Fine. Now, 
The dress that was found at Della's house. We need to know who bought it. See, I found the charge slip right here. It has the sales number and the design. Okay. You have the receipt for the shoes by any chance? It's in here someplace. Need some help in there, dear? No, thank you. Here. All right. I'm off. Hope I'm doing the right thing with him. I'm the one who should be concerned, and I'm not. You'll see. Well, I have to get the cleaning crew in here and order some more supplies. Della, you do recall that you are the client. Perry, for the first time, I know what it's like to be the accused. So I'd like to stay busy. In that case, I need detailed information on all members of the family, in particular their finances, and whatever you can get on the housekeeper. That should hold me for a while. I don't know if I've mentioned it, but it's nice seeing you again. Ma'am, everything we have is out here. My sister did it. Will she be able to return it later? Ma'am, this is a sale. I'll look around. Okay. Hi. Hi, can I help you? I'm trying to find out how many of this dress in this size was... Wait, well, who are you? Private investigator. This is very important. Look, I really don't have time uh, right now. I have a lot of customers. Uh, like me. You know what? I'll take this. You actually want this? You can't resist a sale. Would you do me a favor? Would you just take a look at this receipt? Tell me when the dress was available. Okay. Uh, first two weeks of this month. That's great. Why great? Because it won't take you long to go back through your receipts and tell me how many in this... Look, I don't have time. Oh, it doesn't have to be right now. As long as it's soon. This afternoon is soon enough. People do this kind of thing for you often? All the time. Hmm. Don't even have to buy anything. And you're really going to take this? That depends. It's me. Listen, we got to talk. They're getting close. Well, I don't like it. I'm staying on this guy's case. No, you listen to me. I want to get very lost, and that means I want more, and soon. Got it? Call you later. Yes. He's expecting you. Mr. Mason is here. Just be a moment. Is he in? He's with Mrs. Gordon. Tell him I'm here. David Gordon is on his way in. Sorry to interrupt like this, Ken, but since Paula won't return my phone calls, I had to do something. What is it you want? Putting our personal feelings about each other aside for a moment, we have to talk about Gordon Industries. Really? Father ran it pretty much as a one-man operation, and there's no one in the company ready to step into his position. Besides you, evidently. I think it's important for the profile of the company that we demonstrate quickly a continuity of leadership. David. Your record as an entrepreneur is dismal. And Arthur never had anything but contempt for your judgment. There's just no way in hell you're going to take over the company. You better talk to her, Ken. Catherine, Laura, and I jointly own 50% of this company, and a fight for control could hurt everyone. Which is exactly why you won't do it. Now, don't try to bluff me, David. You haven't got the style. Talk to her.
Yes. Yes, sir. You can go in now. Thank you. Hello, Ken. Nice seeing you again. Nice to see you, Harry. Harry Mason, Paula Gordon. Thank you for meeting me, Mrs. Gordon. I've explained to Mrs. Gordon that she's under no obligation to talk to you, Perry. I'm not sure why I would want to speak with the lawyer who's representing my husband's murderer. First of all, Mrs. Gordon, it has not been proven that Miss Street killed your husband. Second, your cooperation will save you the inconvenience of a formal deposition. She's not withdrawing her cooperation, Perry. Let's just make it brief, shall we? Yes. You're the head of the Arthur Gordon Foundation. Could you tell me what that entails? The Arthur Gordon Foundation is basically a philanthropic endeavor, awarding grants and funding to various projects, such as conservation research, aid to artists, that sort of thing. The foundation operates out of my offices, Perry, using my staff under the direction of Mrs. Gordon. Why was your husband going to remove you as director? That's a private matter. I'm sure it is, but I'd like to know. Actually, my husband didn't need a reason for behaving badly. I understand that you and Mr. Gordon weren't living together, that Mr. Gordon moved you to a Century City apartment. Moved me? Were those Della Street's very words? Were you upset that she was replacing you as director of the foundation? Upset? Listen, Della Street is obviously insane. She has never done anything but try to manipulate Arthur. She wanted him all to herself. When it finally dawned on her that she was not going to get what she wanted, she does this lunatic, obscene thing. Perry, we can't go on with this. It's too provocative. Yes, perhaps it is. Thank you, Mrs. Gordon. Oh, Ken. I saw David Gordon on my way in here. What did he say to you? Should he have said something? No. Of course not. He also seemed on edge. But then it's a trying time for all of us. Sorry. Paula. I shouldn't have lost my temper like that. If he puts you on the stand, and I suspect that he will, you'd better play down any expressions of jealousy. I understand.
slightest hint to the lieutenant, I let you look at that evidence and property and all level you. I can't figure out why I let you talk me into it. Stuck up for you in school, let people know you were born just a big dumb jock. Who said I was a dumb jock? Rather not mention any names. So don't worry, I took care of it. <laughs> I'm not sure I even liked you. Bullet hole in the temple. <laughs> Shot must have come from up there. Explains why he lost control of the car. Why is this guy following Drake? We're not sure yet, but we think it has to do with Della Street. Who was he? According to his ID, his name was Robert Lynch, running a make on him. Paul, free to go? You got everything you need from him? Yep. Okay, you can go. Thank you, Lieutenant. <clears throat> Thanks for coming down. I think they would have helped me all night. Probably. Well, I'm not looking for applause or anything, but this is a small break in the case, wouldn't you say? You wouldn't. It would have been if we had Lynch alive. Don't look at me. I didn't shoot him. No, you followed him. But he caught on to you. Night, Paul. But, uh... Paul. Your office, 10 a.m. Sharp. Stratton! No, what do you want? <laughs> oh, boy. You've had a tough day, I can tell. Why don't you let me buy you a cup of coffee? Old time's sake, huh? Well, you're buying it. I wrote up the information you wanted on the members of the family. Excellent, Mystery. Excellent. He's late. I'm a bit late, but I don't think you'll mind when you take a look at that right from the police lab. It says here that the bullet that killed Lynch came from a 32 caliber pistol. I couldn't exactly see who fired at him, but I did get a flash of the gun. It was very shiny, like it was silver plated or something. Here's a full rundown on Robert. He preferred Bobby Lynch. How do you get all this? Sergeant Stratton is a friend of mine. He can't do enough for me. As you can see by this report, Bobby was a very bad boy. This is interesting. The last time Lynch was in prison, he stabbed a prisoner while doing time for knifing a tavern owner. But a woman stabbed Gordon. We assumed it was a woman only because the housekeeper saw someone dressed like you running away in the dark. What, are you suggesting that uh, Robert killed Gordon in drag? I'm saying it's possible. Look at this. He was 5'6", weighed 140 pounds. He could have fit into that dress. That's quite a theory. Each member of this family had a lot to gain by Gordon's death. One or more of them could have hired Lynch to commit their murder, then dispose of him when he became a liability. I'd say we need to find out everything we can about this man, Lynch. Well, Robert was staying at a hotel downtown. Why don't I run over there and snoop around? Why don't you? But Paul... Yes, I know. No breaking and entering. First thing on my list. We're seeing the family when. Uh, they read the will at 11. Nice work, Paul. Thank you, Della. You didn't think so? Think what? That it was nice work. Oh, yes. You didn't mention it. He's still on the case, isn't he? Your father was a very dear friend to me. I didn't kill him. I believe you. By the way, this is Perry Mason, Della Street's attorney. Get her out of here. Paula. I won't have it. Della Street is a beneficiary under the terms of your late husband's will. She has a right to be present. That is correct. It's grotesque. Exactly who are you trying to impress with your outrage, Paula? You were as happy to see him gone as anyone else. Catherine, don't say that. I think it's time to proceed. By all means, let's don't deal with it. Let's 
get on with it, shall we? If no one objects, I won't read the whole document now, but will specify the distribution of assets. Naturally, you will each be given copies of the will later. First, the shares in the company are to be divided as follows. 50% to Paula, the remaining 50% distributed equally between David, Catherine, and Laura. This house, the Century City apartment, the lodge in Aspen, along with all their contents, are left to Paula. David is to receive all of Arthur's personal belongings, along with cash in the amount of four million dollars. Catherine and Laura are to receive four million dollars each. And Della Street, five hundred thousand dollars. Get out of my house. Della didn't kill your husband. I have good reason to believe he was killed by a man dressed to look like her. What are you talking about? What man? I believe an ex-convict named Lynch was hired to kill Mr. Gordon. Hired by whom? One of you. Only one of you could have given Lynch the security code to this house. Only one of you. Now that is intriguing. Personally, I suspect me. Okay, let's wrap it up. Saw the lights on, thought I'd come by and take a look. You called the precinct and asked where I was. Lieutenant Cooper was very helpful. He speaks very highly of you, by the way. He does. Rick, what are you doing here? This is where Lynch was staying, huh? Are you trying to get me suspended or something? You know what I want to know, Stratton? How could a guy like Lynch afford a hotel suite like this? Where'd you find this? Bedroom. Guess he was a little weird. I want to show Mason this. Hey, Drake, get out of here. Hey, now I'm willing to live up to my end of the deal. What deal? I find something you're the first to know. My word on that. This is an important piece of evidence. Out of here, or I bust you for obstructing justice. You don't mean that. Beat it now. You mean it. All right, I'm going, but I'm very disappointed. Okay, you guys, come on, let's wrap it up. Let's go. Okay, let's pack it up. I'm ready. Is he at the lab?
This is Miss Della Street. We have the estate's permission to remove her personal belongings. We didn't mean to startle you. It's okay. I thought I'd left something in here. Excuse me. Laura. That was odd enough. What do you suppose she was looking for? I should have a key. Yeah, here it is. What's that? Seems as though Mr. Gordon was keeping a file on Laura's husband, Chris. He's been a very active young man. He's a ranked tennis player. This ranking isn't about tennis. Still a little bit wet out on the courts. So we're going to go for a drink. Terrible weather. I'm sure a ranking player like her husband must be disappointed. Yes, I'm sure he is. May I ask you a question? I suppose so. Why were you in your father's study? I told you I thought I forgot something in there. Wouldn't happen to be a report, would it? No, why? There's one on your father's desk from a private detective on your husband's extramarital affairs. I don't know anything about that. It's hard to imagine your father wouldn't have mentioned it to you. If you had removed that report, it might have appeared that you were trying to cover up. One more reason why you might have had your father killed. I think you'd better leave. How's it going to look when I put you on the stand and it comes out that you needed your inheritance to support him? I did not kill my father. I couldn't do that. You or your husband could have hired someone to do it for you. Leave me alone. So what's going on? Just talking about your game. Good day. Okay. Are you all right? Take me home. I gotta take Janice back to her place. Janice can take the cab. You're taking me home. Since when do you give orders? Since I inherited four million dollars. What are we arguing about? I'll get her a cab and then we'll go home and relax, okay? Did you get a good look at any of them? No. Could you recognize the voice if you heard it again? No, but I won't forget those cowboy boots. I can't subpoena a pair of cowboy boots. Look, from where I was, I'm very lucky I didn't break my neck. You've been close to important leads on two occasions. Both times they've gotten away from you. Come on, Perry. I'll admit I haven't exactly saved the day, but I have not come up empty-handed either. We do not have one concrete bit of evidence on Della's behalf. I am just as concerned about Della as you are. Perry, what would you like me to do? Find a way to tie Lynch into whoever hired him. Consider it done. Paul, oh, it's the large amount of money Gordon left Della in his will. It gives the prosecution one thing it did not have, a motive. The report said Lynch had a wife. I can't find it. I thought I was ready, you. Come on, am I asking for much? He had an ex-wife. An ex-wife? Well, no wonder I can't find her. She was probably going by her maiden name. Where is she? Stratton! Stratton. I don't. Police, open up! Freeze. 
back in the room. Come on. Nice shot. You gonna tell me where the ex-wife is now? At a country and western dump called the Quarter Horse Club. Thanks. Hey, what are friends for? Have a nice day. the interest, okay? It's your last chance. Sorry about your old man. What are you doing here? You're very hard to reach on the phone. What do you want? Where were you Wednesday afternoon around 5 o'clock? Why do you want to know? Bobby Lynch, the ex-convict I think murdered your father, was killed about then. Probably by whoever hired him. Wait a minute. You're saying I hired him? I have an inventory of the loans you've taken out to fund your investment. You're overextended to the point no bank will lend you money. So what? So in spite of what you might have wanted people to think, you were virtually bankrupt. Until your father was killed. You've got a lot of nerve. And nothing to back it up. About Wednesday. Can you prove where you were? I don't have to. There was a gentleman looking for you earlier. Yes, I know. Then he found you. Good. since the divorce. Large family? Well, there's his mom and his dad and his two big brothers. You never met them? No, that's why I wanted to give them my condolences. Oh, I was gonna drive out there this weekend and express my sympathy. But I think it's better if you go. I mean, you are fully ordained. True. Yeah. And sometimes with my new perspective on life, I like to look for redeeming things about Bobby Lynch. But I just can't think of any. I can't imagine how you got him to go to your church. Well, it was kind of touch and go. Uh, wh where is his family? Out near Acton. Yeah. We're ready. Oh, I gotta go. Oh, just where is your ministry anyway? Um, everywhere. Oh, that's 
That's wonderful. <laughs> Beautiful place you have here, Miss Gordon. There's no place like home, and for what I've paid for it, there shouldn't be. How did you get along with your father? He thought I was a tramp. I thought he was a cold, remote tyrant who drove my mother to suicide. We understood each other. Are you always this candid? Thirteen years of analysis helped. I assume you're here because you think I had something to do with his murder. Where were you Wednesday afternoon? I can't recall that far back. Can you recall who's in the next room? What? There was another drink on this table. It's still wet. Why don't I guess and say it's Ken Braddock? Lucky guess, Perry? Not altogether. I noticed at the reading of the will you didn't light her cigarette, but handed her your lighter. A fairly intimate gesture. <laughs> Very good. He's cute. Why the deception? All right. Once this all quiets down, I'm filing for divorce. Perry, I would hope my relationship with Catherine would remain confidential. I can understand that. Oh, and by the way, Catherine was here with me Wednesday afternoon. All afternoon. My wife thinks I was in San Diego with a client. Thank you both. I'll see myself out. You don't have to cover for me. Serious matter, Kate. I've been thinking. I don't think we should see each other for a while. Until you get around to divorcing your wife. Oh, come on now. All I need is just a little more time. I've been giving you that. Kate. I love you. Doesn't everyone? I really do love you. Be patient. I'm trying. Stella, still here? Mm-hmm. Perry needed some background information on the foundation. What are you doing? I have to run out to Acton, talk to Lynch's family. Acton? I just read something about that. Here, here, look. The Gordon Foundation has a solar power research project there. Let me see that. That's our tie-in, the foundation to Lynch. To Paula? What are you doing with that? Taking out some insurance. You better talk to Perry about that first. Well, don't worry about me, Dill. I'm not planning on using this, but if I have to, I know exactly what to do with it. But... We'll see you in court. Bullets. <laughs> Job. 
isn't it? Why, I suppose so. Good morning, Counselor. Yes, it is. All please rise. Division 6 of the Municipal Court of Los Angeles County, State of California, is now in session. Honorable Norman Whitewood presiding. Please be seated and come to order. Got any gas? Business was so bad, the company took their pumps back. How much further to Acton from here? We're stepping in it. Look, I'm from the uh, State Solar Power Commission. There's a project near here I'm supposed to inspect. Could you direct me, please? Never seen a solar project. You ever hear of one? <laughs> Not around here. Could you direct me to the Lynch's place? That I can do. Um, go up to the first crossroads, turn left, go down that for two miles, and then take your first right. That'll get you there. Thank you. No big deal. Yeah, you wanted me to call if somebody asked about your project. Hmm. Well, somebody just did. Yeah, he's a young guy. He's on his way. All right. Bye-bye. Dr. Henderson, you are a medical examiner in the employ of the County of Los Angeles, is that correct? Yes. Did you do an autopsy on the deceased? Yes. And did you reach an opinion as to the cause of death? The deceased died from a wound caused by the penetration of a sharp instrument through the solar plexus upward into his heart. I show you People's Exhibit 3 and ask you if you recognize this? Yes, it has my mark on it. I see. Mm -hmm. Now I show you People's Exhibit 4, a dress. Did you have an occasion to examine this? Yes. And what were your findings? Blood stains on the material were the same as the blood type of the deceased, type O. Thank you very much. Your witness. Dr. Henderson, how long have you been a medical examiner? 14 years. In that time, have you seen other fatal injuries such as in this case? Yes. How often have you seen wounds like this? I can't say exactly, probably in excess of 200. How much force would be necessary to inflict this type wound? Oh, well, considerable. Why is that? Because of the tough muscles surrounding the heart and the protective placement of the rib cage. With that in mind, would it be fair to say that the force necessary would be more than considerable? I suppose so, yes. Thank you, Dr. Henderson. That'll be all. Let me step down.
thanks. I'll let myself out. Please tell the court what you saw next. I hurried to the top of the stairs, which looked down to the foyer. I saw a woman run out of the house. Could you identify her? No. Her back was to me. I show you this dress marked People's Exhibit 4 and ask you if you recognize it. The woman I saw was wearing a dress that looked exactly like that. Prior to this occasion, have you ever seen a dress like this? Yes. Who was wearing it? Ms. Della Street. Your witness. Mrs. Jeffries, you testified that you were in bed when you were buzzed on the intercom. That's right. Were you asleep? Watching TV. Do you wear glasses? No. Have you ever? No. When was the last time you had an eye examination? During my physical, two months ago. Your eyesight was perfect. Objection. Calls for expert testimony on the part of the witness. Sustained. Was your eyesight 2020? Yes, it was. It is. How dark was the foyer that evening? Not so dark that I couldn't see a woman in that dress running away. Oh, oh, no. Mrs. Jeffries, did you get a good look at the woman who just ran out? Just from the back. Could you describe what she was wearing? A flowered print dress, and she was carrying a beige handbag with a shoulder strap. Mr. Jones, please ask the woman to come back inside. I must congratulate you, Mrs. Jeffries. The description of the dress and the bag were completely accurate. You missed only one significant detail. This is not a woman. Oh. Order in the court. Order in the court. Quiet, please. This gentleman is Robert Hunter a professional Hollywood stuntman who has doubled for many top female television and motion picture stars. I object on the grounds of relevance, Your Honor. The days of these theatrics are long since gone. Mr. Mason, have you any further questions for this witness? No, Your Honor. You may step down, Mrs. Jeffries. Counsel? Your Honor, Mr. Mason is trying to compensate for his lack of any credible defense by turning this courtroom into a sideshow. I'm trying to establish the plausibility that someone beside the defendant killed Mr. Gordon. In this case, a man. I still object to this kind of disruptive behavior. This line of questioning is irrelevant and immaterial. Your Honor, my client is on trial for murder. I ask the court for the widest possible latitude. Well, I concur, Mr. Mason, so I'm overruling your objections. But I am cautioning a defense to keep his performance within the bounds of acceptable court procedure. I appreciate the court's indulgence. Uh, he's allowing me to introduce the concept of Bobby Lynch. Where is Paul? Morning. Looking for Mr. Lynch. Who are you? I'm from the insurance company. You selling? No, uh, we were carrying a policy on his son, Robert. I have a check for him. I'll be pleased. Hope so. Step ahead. Thank you.
come down real easy. Ah, don't turn around. All right. Now. You're the one that shot my son? No, I'm not. Who said I did? Bailiff, will you show the witness People's Exhibit 4, please? Do you recognize that dress? Yes. Your store sold that particular style and make of dress, is that correct? Yes, we carried it the first two weeks of last month. Thank you, Bailiff. Do you recognize this man? Yes. Let the record show the witness has identified one Robert Lynch. Did uh, Lynch purchase that dress from you? Yes. Now, you have a lot of customers pass through your store. How is it you remember him? He was very specific about what he wanted. Do you remember anything else about him? Yes, he paid cash. Thank you. Your witness? <clears throat> Is there anyone else in this courtroom you recall having bought this dress? Yes. Could you point that person out, please? That woman. Let the record show that the witness identified the defendant. You can't officer. park there. Excuse me, I have an emergency. This is an illegal parking zone. Excuse me, but I have to get there in court. There is a parking lot two blocks down. Listen, this is a question of life or death. Is there some kind of an arrangement that you and what I can make? What do you mean? What's the worst you can hit me with here? Well, illegal parking, blocking access to a public building, and probably some minor vehicle condition infractions. I'll take it. Just leave it on the windshield, and please don't tow me, all right? Mr. Williams, you are a parole officer employed by the state of California. Is that correct? It is. How well did you know Robert Lynch? He was a parolee he reported to me. And how long since he was released from the penitentiary? About six months. Why was Lynch in prison? A manslaughter conviction. He stabbed a man to death. Are you aware of the circumstances surrounding the death of Robert Lynch? Just that he was shot and killed. Objection, Your Honor, again on the grounds of relevancy. The defense is attempting to show that Robert Lynch killed Arthur Gordon and was in turn himself murdered by the person who hired him in order to guarantee his silence. As I ruled earlier, the court is willing to grant a wide latitude, but when does defense expect to substantiate the relevance of all this? Your Honor, we intend to do that now. Overruled. No questions at this time. No further questions. You may step down, Mr. Williams. Mr. Mason. I called Paula Gordon to the stand. You're head of the Arthur Gordon Foundation, are you not? That's correct. And you uh, personally approved all of the grants and projects that the Foundation endows? Yes. Are you familiar with a certain solar power project located near Acton, California? Yes. Have you inspected the facility? No. But you did sign the checks for that project? Yes. That's all. But I don't understand. No further questions, Mrs. Gordon. Miss Gordon, do you own a gun? Yes. Could you describe it for the court? It's a silver plated 32 caliber revolver with a pearl handle. Pearl handle? My father gave it to me as sort of a joke. He thought I had very expensive tastes. <laughs> he was right. <laughs> <laughs> 
Where do you keep that revolver? At my home. Is it there now? Yes. I must object to this line of questioning as totally irrelevant and immaterial. The victim in this case was killed by a stabbing. Mr. Mason. Your Honor, I have only one more question of the witness. Overruled. How can you be sure the gun is still at your home? It's in a drawer in my bedstand. I saw it there this morning. No further questions. Mr. Braddock, you are the attorney for the Arthur Gordon Foundation, is that correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. Naturally, you're familiar with the solar project at Acton? Yes, I drew up all the documents for Mrs. Gordon. Who received the money for the construction of the project? Well, that's rather difficult to answer, Mr. Mason. I have an attorney-client relationship with Mrs. Gordon and the Foundation. That information is privileged. But your activities are not privileged, Counselor. And you're under oath. I don't need you to explain that to me, Mr. Mason. Mr. Braddock, are you aware there is no such project in existence? No, I wasn't aware of that. Isn't it true that you diverted that project money to yourself? No. Isn't it true that you needed the money to support your mistress, Catherine Gordon? Absolutely not. Would you like to reconsider your testimony? No. In that case, Mr. Braddock, would you like me to read to the court a sworn statement by one Frank Lynch describing how you not only used him to divert the funds to you, but paid him to protect your fraud? How you hired his son, Robert Lynch, to murder Arthur Gordon and frame Della Street? Would you like me to read it, Mr. Braddock? Isn't it true that if Della Street took over the directorship of the foundation, she'd have discovered your secret? So you had to get her and Gordon out of the way? Isn't it true you killed Lynch with Catherine's revolver, then tried to use her as an alibi for your whereabouts that day? Isn't it true that murder was going to be the solution to all your problems? You'd have the money, the girl, and no one would ever know. Isn't it true, Mr. Braddock? I'm sorry, Kate. Mr. Braddock. Isn't it all true? Yes. Did you move for a dismissal, Mr. Mason? I most certainly did, Your Honor. Do the people object? No objection, Your Honor. Very well, case dismissed. This court is adjourned. All rise. Not bad, considering I didn't exactly get a sworn statement from Lynch. <laughs> What is that? This is the cutoff notice from the phone company. I didn't say I had a statement, just if you'd like me to read one. <laughs> well, what do we do now? We'll celebrate. In that case, I'd like to buy you both lunch. I'll be along in a moment. Stella. Congratulations. Could I take a look at that statement? 
No. You can have it. And I'd pick up that 32 pistol while Braddock's prints are still on it. Oh, right. Thanks. Until we meet again. I thought you said you had a car. This is it. Hop in. Uh, before I forget, nice work. You too. <laughs> Robert, there's something wrong with this batch of balloons. Okay, Susie, print that, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, that's a wrap. We're gonna pick up the coverage from here on Friday night if we can find a blank that works. All right. All right, folks, that's a wrap. Atmosphere, stop by, wardrobe, sign your vouchers. Pick up a call, see from Carol. Thank you. That's a wrap. Kate! Hey, Kate! Front center, your director's here. Question that begs to be asked: yes, How did he does. keep his rug on in those actions? <laughs> Not here. Oh, where much I can see. Went back to the hotel about half an hour ago. She wasn't feeling well. She didn't tell me she wasn't feeling well. Since when is telling you everything in her contract? Since when is taking care of her wardrobe in yours? She forgot some stuff. She didn't forget, Eric. She just didn't take it with her to wherever it is she really went. She's at her hotel. Eric, I can still smell the perfume she had on before she left. Now, where is she? You know, Eric, you're going to keep crossing me. I swear the only careers you'll end up managing won't belong to chimpanzees. You understand that? Where is she? I can't wait to see. We're going to have to wait until another time to hear more about She went out to dinner. Archers. She went out to dinner. By time we'll see you Did tomorrow you night with some other Did she go with him? Rick Ray himself. Who do you think? Kiss somebody with tongues uh, gleaming and uh, <laughs> tomorrow night. Thank you, Donna Scott, I'll for be being here. with us.
Good evening. I hope you enjoyed your meal. Oh, yes, thank you. Hello, John. Mr. McKay, how are you? Very well, thank you. Listen, uh, is, uh, is Kate Huntley here tonight? Oh, yes, she is. She's is with Mr. Carr. So I sit another place? No, no, no. No, that'll be fine. Thank you very much. You know, Robert makes me feel like I'm suffocating sometimes. I know he doesn't mean to, but he... Uh... Well, that's why sometimes it's good to step back and take a break. No wonder they call this the Big Apple. You never know when you're going to run into a big worm. Well, look who's here. Come on, let's go. What do you mean, come on, let's go? I heard you weren't feeling well, so I'm here to take you home, okay? Robert. Look, uh, we're just two old friends having dinner. Come on, sit down, join us. Oh, you're two friends. That's why you come over and sneak behind my back, is that why? I didn't want you to know where I was going because I knew this is how you'd react. Well, we're getting out of here and I'm not taking no for an answer. Come on. Come on. Come on. Hey, hey, I thought you came to New York to play a detective, not a jackass. Don't you have a wife somewhere? Come on. Come on. Mr. Carr. Mr. McKay. Take it easy, Robert. McKay. You don't want that face in the morning papers, especially with a lump on it. Right. <clears throat> All right. I got news for you, lady. I've been along for the ride all day. This is where I get off. Just give me a little hey. more time. I don't have any. What do we have to do to get quiet around here? I can't even hear myself think. Thank you. Gee. That's what I thought. Okay, folks, we gotta go one more time. Listen, get a new mic on her, okay? And we'll go as soon as you get a level. Honey, you were terrific, but your mic stopped, okay? Can you get me one more just like that? No problem. Jerry, could you help me get this off? Hey, Bobby. Yeah. As long as you're gonna go again, how about if I cut in even closer? This time? Uh, okay, look, Ray, let me get back with you in just a second, okay? Jed! Big guy, how you doing? Fine, Robert. How's yourself? Look, I need a uh, small favor. Yeah? I need to borrow a prop gun. Oh, no, well, look. Come on. Look, it's just part of the night, okay? Like Robert, those guns are supposed to be either locked up or at my side at all times. I'm not going to get fired. You know? Jed, you're not going to get fired. I'm the director, okay? Hmm. Look, I'm going to I'm gonna shoot Steve Carr tonight on his show. Do what? Well, they're blank, Jed. I'm not going to use real bullets. What do you think? I'm crazy? Look. It's a joke. You follow me? I mean, it's, it's a setup thing between him and I. I mean, right there on live TV? Yeah, but well, look. No, the thing is, is that you can't... You can't tell anyone, right? Because it's a secret, you understand? You well, follow? No, I won't tell if you won't. Okay, all right. All right. Hey, Robert. What time does the car show start again? Uh, 11 o'clock tonight. Okay, I'll be watching. Hey, okay. stand by, everyone. First team, take your places. We're ready for you, Robert. Okay, Pete. Thanks a lot, Jim. Okay. All right, Pete, anytime you're ready, I'm ready. All right, folks, this will be picture. We're going again, atmosphere. We were so poor, my folks couldn't afford to buy me any shoes. They had to paint my feet black and lace up my toes. Take two and three. My father and mother were so poor, they couldn't afford to have children. So the neighbors had me. There were five kids Okay, in uh, Mel, get ready to cue Louie. I'll be and, honest with uh, you. And two, zoom out and get ready to pick up Marty when he joins Steve. And I thank you. Hit the applause and cue Louie. And ready to <laughs> and take two. Three, stay right where you are. One, wake up, we're coming your way. Ready, one, and one. Uh, it's your first time here, and you're a very funny guy. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> and ready, two, and... Something. Take two. Okay, let's see if we can get in a subtle plug Great. for you. Here, I understand you're appearing the 12th through the 15th at the Melody Land Ballroom. I'd better have a you Hey, you it's Robert McKay. What's going on here? Take three. Well, I think you made us all a little nervous with that material. <laughs> the lady in the front row. Stay with him, three. Full shot, two, and take two. Well, if it isn't Robert McKay, ladies and gentlemen, crashing yet another party. <laughs> He shot him! Peter! Tom, what's going on down there? Tom! Get to the music! Get to the music! What's going on there? All right, all right, put up a card. All right, all right. Hit the music and applaud. Make the graphic. Go to commercial. Come on! Peter! Move it! We're clear. I don't know.
John. Another drink, Mr. McKay? Yeah, please. Uh, what's, uh, what's going on? What's the matter with everybody? Well, someone has just shot Steve Carr. <laughs> yeah, no, I did, as a joke. A joke? Yeah. He'll be here any minute. He'll uh, tell you all about it. I don't think so. He's just been admitted to Lexington General in critical condition. Harris, homicide. There was a trial once when the artist Whistler sued a man for libel about remarks he made concerning the fees Whistler charged for his paintings. Can you tell me, the opposing lawyer asked, how long it took you to complete your painting? Whistler replied, two days. And you expect 200 guineas for your two days work? No, I expect it for the knowledge of a lifetime. <laughs> Which is another way of saying how important our law library is. And if you think I've invited you here tonight to put undue pressure on you for a contribution, you're right. <laughs> Now, what's a beautiful woman like you doing alone? I'm just relaxing. How's fundraising going? Fairly well. We're still short of the mark. Thank you. Um. I hear you and Steve are separated. It's been on and off for the last six months. Mainly off. How's Sharon? I don't see her very much. Unless, of course, I buy an issue of Vogue when she's on the cover. Allison, are you all right? I keep telling myself that it's over, that I should stop fighting him, that he let me go, so I should just let him go. It's just that I, I don't sleep very well at night. And sometimes on weekends, I, I drink a little bit too much. I don't have an occupation. And I have a husband that sometimes doesn't call me back. Other than that, I'm fine, really. I'd like to help. You already have. Come on, let's go back to the party. Mother. Sharon, what are you doing? Steve's been shot. What? Where is he? Is he all right? He's dead. Thank you. Excuse me. Come in. Hello, Perry. Good to see you, Sydney. I ordered some coffee. I could use some. The red eye from L.A. is starting to get to me. When we were in law school, you couldn't afford to go to the movies, much less produce them. Sit down. <laughs> Thank you. I suppose you've read that Robert McKay was arrested. Yes. He's directing and starring in our picture with a budget of $30 million. We're not a major studio, Perry. 
If we shut this down, and we'll have to if we lose McKay, it's a disaster for us. So, uh, you want me to represent him? Immediately. I was on the phone the entire flight out here. The police charged him with murder less than five minutes after Carr died. They would have looked like fools if they hadn't. Perry, I've known Bob McKay for years. Steve Carr was his friend. Forty million people watched McKay commit murder. Perry, I know you believe that no matter what the circumstances, a person is entitled to the best possible legal defense. That presents a problem. Allison Carr has been a good friend for more than 20 years. I'm not sure I could represent McKay. Perry, as a personal favor to me, go and talk to McKay. Just talk to him. It was a joke. It was, um, it was just a stupid joke. Uh, Steve and I patched things up in his apartment. We had a couple of drinks, and he got this idea about me coming on to his show, and we would fake a shooting. Was anyone present during this discussion? No, no, no. Did you tell anyone? I tell anyone? I uh, I told the prop man. Did anyone have access to the gun? I put the gun. Put the gun in my glove compartment. But I didn't lock it. Can you explain how a round of live ammunition got into the gun? No, I can't. Mr. McKay, you just shot and killed a man on nationwide television. And you're going to ask the court to believe that someone put a live shell in your revolver? Yes, I am. You publicly fought with Carr the night before. Why should we believe this story of yours? Why? Because it's true, that's why. Well, that's not good hey, enough. Wait a minute. I don't need you coming in here and telling me how bad this looks. And I don't need you coming in here putting me down. I didn't murder Steve Carr. And I don't care if you believe that or not, because that's the truth. Forget about me, Mr. McKay. Why should anyone believe you didn't kill him? Because he was my friend. I'll see you at the bail hearing. How could you do this? I think he's innocent. He killed Steve. He pulled the trigger on the gun, but someone else could have put bullets in the gun. I don't believe I'm hearing this. How could you possibly defend that man? I thought you were my friend. Allison, I am your friend. But McKay deserves his day in court. Get out? This is a case in which the risk of flight is substantial, to say the least. On the contrary, my client is under enormous pressure to complete a multi-million dollar motion picture in New York. Your points are well taken, gentlemen. Bail will be set at uh, $150,000 with the stipulation that Mr. McKay stay at all times within the municipal boundaries of New York City. Well, Councillor, we meet again. That we do. I would prefer a fair fight, but I must admit it's reassuring to know that I have 40 million eyewitnesses at my disposal. <laughs> if you were going to kill someone, Mr. Reston, would you do it in front of 40 million people? No. But then I'm not Robert McKay. That's right. You're not. <laughs> Ray, what are you doing here? I'm just making sure the wheels of justice ain't running you over. <laughs> Are you okay, Bobby? Well, I'm better and okay. I'm free as far as I know. Uh, right. Excuse me, Mr. Mason, this is my stunt coordinator, Ray Anderson. Ray, this is my attorney, Perry Mason. Hey, Perry. Listen, next time you get an idea for a practical joke, you clear it with me. You got that? Yeah, don't worry about it. Of course, I thought it was going to be pretty funny myself, but... You knew about the joke beforehand? 
Well, well, Bobby was wearing a radio mic when he asked Jed to borrow the prop pistol. You could hear him playing his day over by the mixer. Did anyone else overhear this conversation? Oh, well, Kate was standing right there. If uh, you'll excuse us, sir, Mr. McKay has bail money to arrange. Right. Well, listen, Ray, thanks. Oh, sure, listen. Uh, I'll see you on a sec, good buddy. Okay, thank you. That's good news. I mean, that's great. Now we can prove that shooting Steve was supposed to be a joke, right? A strong case could be made that you wanted to be overheard to set up this murder. Oh. Look. Who's to say you didn't switch the blank in that gun with the real bullet? Although it does prove something. What's that? That at least two other people could have. Hello, hello. Hello there. <laughs> When'd you get in? Last night. Well, 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 I really didn't need anything quite this expensive. Anything with a terrace would do. Mm -hmm. We're using Perry's suite as our offices. Uh, your room will be ready shortly. Well, I guess we won't be here long. You see an instant replay of the shooting every time you turn on the television set. McKay did pull that trigger, but he thought he was firing a blank. It was a joke for the audience. Some joke. Mm -hmm. Only someone switched that blank with a real bullet. Do we seriously believe this? We do. Oh. Who else knew about the joke? Uh, the uh, prop man is working on the film Robert's making, Jed Page. And uh, the stunt coordinator, Ray Anderson, and Kate Huntley. They were all on location that day. They all had access to the glove compartment of Robert's car, which is where the gun was stored. Anybody on Steve Carr's side of it know about this joke? I don't know that yet. Even if they did, how would anyone know what kind of bullet to put in that gun? McKay always uses a 357 Magnum in his movies. It's his trademark. I'm afraid Allison is in no mood to be helpful, but I'm gonna to try to see her again. Paul, I'd like you to check out those people Della just mentioned. Oh, by the way, nice to see you. It was a uh, tragic accident. And it was, it was a stupid thing for me to do. And it was a very senseless way for a good friend to, to die. But it's over and life goes on, I guess. Now, on the advice of my attorney, that's all I, uh, that's all I can and will say about the shooting incident anyway. And as of today, this set will be closed to all media personnel. The uh, last thing we need to be doing is tripping over reporters every time we're trying to get a setup. I mean, we're making a hit movie here, are we not? Yeah. All right. Oh, yeah, there's one more thing. Uh, there's a guy here, he's somewhere by the name of uh, Paul Drake. Paul? Right here? Right over here. Um, not only is Paul a uh, real honest to goodness private eye, but he's, uh, he's working very hard to clear me, so I, I would really appreciate any help you can give him. Okay? Let's make a movie, guys. Mr. Page? Yo. Oh, hi. Name's Paul Drake. Yeah. Boy, oh boy, you got everything in here, don't you? No, oh, you bet. Let me ask you something. Any ideas as to how a live round got into that gun that McKay used on Steve Carr? It had a blank in when Robert put it in his car, that's all I know. But I'll tell you something else. Robert McKay never would have killed Steve Carr on purpose, never. Why? Because they were friends? Oh, sure. So what you're saying is one of the film crew did it. No, I never said that. 
Look, this is family. Everybody here loves Robert. None of these people would do anything to hurt him. The problem is, maybe somebody did. Wait a second. Are you saying somebody here did this just to get Robert? What if it wasn't Steve Carr they were out to get? What if it was McKay? It's a thought. I hope I'm not making a mistake letting you come by here. I mean, you can't possibly justify what you're doing. Of course I can. Why are you here? Sharon, I think we should listen to what he has to say. Why? Because I'm convinced McKay is innocent. He's an actor. He's supposed to be convincing. They were friends for 20 years. They fought, but they also played jokes on each other. They were friends, Allison. Now, be honest, both of you. Do you really believe that Robert McKay would want to kill Steve? I'm not sure. Did Steve tell you Robert was going to pretend to shoot him? No, I hadn't, I hadn't spoken with him in at least two weeks. Someone else he might have told? Someone connected with his show? That's possible. Steve didn't leave anything up to chance. Any ideas? His producer? Director? What about girlfriend? I wouldn't know. Perry, I don't even know why she's talking to you. I didn't do it. Hey. I didn't do it. I want to believe you. Why don't you try? I didn't do it. You gotta believe that. And I love you very, very much. Okay, cut it and print it. Okay, folks, new setup across the street. Kate, for God's sake, we gotta talk about this. About the picture? What's it to you? Kate's a professional. She's here to do a picture. Is that what you wanna talk about? I wanna talk about us. You don't mind, do you? Then I'm afraid she'll be in her trailer. Sure. Robert, we're ready for the next setup, okay? Yeah. Paul Drake. I'd like to speak with Kate. Uh, she's changing. Well, that's all right. I'll wait. I'm afraid it's going to take her a while. And after that, she's going to study her lines. And after that, she's got to go sailing. And after that, she's going to have to have lunch. And after that, she has to study more lines, etc. Just, what can I do for you? I understand she overheard Robert telling the prop man what he was going to do to Steve Carr. So? Did she happen to tell anyone? Just me. No one else. How can you be certain of that? It's my job. Tell Miss Huntley I'll be back. You know, um, I'm afraid it's going to be a waste of your time. Carl was putting the moves on Kate, so McKay blew him away. It's that simple. I wish it were. What I want you to think, I want you to make a note to the end. See, we just finished. I want to stand and walk along.
were some kind of urban gorilla? I didn't know what you were. Thank you. A detective is uh, supposed to know these things, isn't he? How do you know I'm a detective? Mm, just part of my job. I'm a reporter. For whom? Does it matter? Well, I suppose it was the New York Times you tell me, right? Your name is Paul Drake, and you've got a big problem. What's that? Forty zillion people watched Robert McKay pull the trigger, and you have to help Perry Mason defend him. Michelle Benty, how do you do? You still didn't tell me who you worked for. I don't see why that is so important. Why is it such a secret? It's not. I work for the uh, National Informer. The informer, like in Cowan, Indiana, glows in the dark. Look, I'm a reporter, and I'm covering a story, and I just think we can help each other out. How's that? Yeah, well, I mean, you've been thrown onto this set you know absolutely nothing about, and I think you have a little background information to catch up on. Which you can fill me in on, of course. Exactly. So what do you think? I think you should take that tape recorder out of your pocket and put it on the bench here so I can see it. My problem is, I'm locked off that set. I need a set of eyes and ears. Which is where I come in. That's right. Why should I do that? Paul, oh, I have dirt on everyone on that set. I know why Eric Brenner hates Robert McKay. I know why Ray Anderson pretends to be his friend. I have an obligation to my client. Just trying to make your job a little easier. All right. Mm -hmm. Something comes of the information you give me. And you'll be the first to know. That's it? That's it. <laughs> Better than nothing, I suppose. Okay, deal. For now. Sorry about that. I'm here concerning the death of Steve Carr. Who are you? Face to face, I'd be glad to tell you. Thank you. My name's Mason. You're representing Robert McKay. That's right. And you are? Peter Town. Good. I understand you directed the Steve Carr show. I used to. Just the way Steve Carr used to be alive. If you're looking to help McKay, try someplace else. All right, Superior Court with a subpoena. Why don't you do that? Mr. Town, I'm only interested in ascertaining the facts. Even Allison Carr cooperated. I'll bet she did. Steve's dead. Now Allison and that daughter of hers can get what they've been after all along. His money. Did Steve tell you that? Many times. And now I've told you, so your day shouldn't be a total loss. It seldom is. Okay, so was I, was I right about Brennan and Anderson or what? Yeah, it looks that way. Yeah? Come on, don't hold out on me, Paul. I don't have anything. Can we go somewhere and talk, maybe, you know? Just Michelle, tell me what you'll get said. something when I'm ready. I'm on a deadline. So is McKay. Okay. Hey, can we go on the other side of her, will you? 
Would you, Tommy? Yeah, try one on the other side. Good. Good. I'm sorry. Excuse me, please. Uh, yeah. Oh. All right, take a break. Mother told me I'm supposed to cooperate. I brought you to this museum once. You were very young. I remember. You've always been a very good friend. My representing McKay doesn't change that. I love my mother, Perry. I don't care what she says, you're hurting her. And believe me, she's been through quite enough. Were you close to Steve Carr? No. Did you like him? No, not particularly. Why not? Because of the way he treated my mother. Does this really matter? It might. Did you talk to Carr the day he was murdered? No. Look. When Steve married my mother, he made it very clear to me that he just didn't want to have me around. So that's why I got shipped off to school in Europe. Now, I was very angry at first, but I've come to realize that in the long run, he really did me a favor because that's where I got started in my modeling career. Sharon, where were you between three and six the afternoon of the murder? Why? That's when the gun that killed Steve was left unattended in McKay's car? I was with my mother. I'm sorry I had to ask. Yeah, you should be sorry. And I learned that Ray Anderson has broken a few bones in the years he and McKay have worked together. And McKay has broken more than a few promises to him. So you think Anderson might have put the bullets in that gun in order to frame McKay? Or Kate Huntley's manager, Eric Brenner. He's not all that fond of McKay himself. I haven't been able to speak with Kate yet. Kate? So, Perry, where do we stand on Allison Carr? She didn't know McKay and her husband had planned the fake shooting. At least that's what she said. So we don't rule her out? No, we can't rule out anyone who might have known about that shooting. Even her daughter? Even her daughter. McKay said his car was parked on the same street on which they're filming. So whoever armed that gun could have done it while McKay was occupied. I'll buy that. Uh, the editor, a fellow named Tommy, has arranged for you to see the footage of the film shot that day. Yeah, Paul. There just might be something on that film. Well, I'll go over the first thing in the morning. I know they're expecting you in 20 minutes. 20? But it's... All right. You two have a nice dinner. Entirely. The 
me put it this way. How soon can we see a print of that stolen footage? Tomorrow morning. Uh, you see, that's what I don't understand. We keep all the negative stock in a vault. So why would he bother stealing that film when all we have to do is make another print? You see, I don't understand that. I guess he was looking for the same thing we were, something incriminating on that film. Which means we're on the right track. Perry Mason, Bella Street, Robert McKay. This is Michelle Benton. Hi, how do you do? Hello. I know you. You're a reporter. At the moment, she's with me. Perry, picture of our thief. Recognize her? Too bad. He's our man. Hello. Well, the honest to goodness PI. Mind if I ask you a few questions? You can ask me a lot of questions. They're not going to need me for a couple of hours. Want some coffee? No, thank you. Would you happen to know this gentleman? Never seen him before. And I'm good at recognizing faces. Hmm. So much for that idea. Tell me something. Do you think Robert did it or not? What? Kill Steve Carr on purpose? I don't think so. Perry Mason doesn't think so. Why? You think so? I don't know. The last time I saw those two together, they were at each other's throats. Robert thought there was something going on between Steve and me. He's the possessive type, huh? He can be a real jerk. But he can also be wonderful. I always swore I would never, ever fall in love with an actor. I guess that pretty much makes me the jerk, doesn't it? So what are you doing here, besides bothering Miss Huntley? You're not bothering me, Eric. We're just talking. I was asking her if she recognized this gentleman. Do you? No. Try looking at his face. So I looked. I still don't know him. Now, if you'll excuse us. Eric, you don't need to be rude. No, that's all right. I can understand why he doesn't want you to talk. I'm trying to help the man who'd like nothing better than to see him fired. The man who thinks he's nothing but a two-bit hustler that you refuse to let go because you tend to be too loyal for your own good. Get out of here. Of course, let's not forget McKay's in love with her. When it comes to threats, that's the biggest one of all, isn't it, Eric? I think you'd better leave here. Now. And he has a temper, too. Maybe even bad enough to put a bullet in a gun. Hello, Mr. Town. Mr. Mason. Somehow I didn't expect to find you visiting Mrs. Carr. Well, she asked if I'd help arrange the memorial dinner we're having for Steve tonight. Since I wasn't busy, I said yes. Would you uh, look at this photo, please? Okay. Now what? Do you recognize him? Would it help McKay if I said yes? Possibly. Well. And it gives me great pleasure to say no. I'm well aware that Peter Town doesn't much care for me. Then again, I don't think he much cares for anyone. How long had Steve known him? Well, they were college roommates. Way back then, they swore that not only would they make it in show business, but they'd make it as a team. And they did. The only problem was that nobody knew that Peter's side of the team existed. Thanks. He was Steve's director, but not his partner or his friend. Is that it? 
Well, I don't know the details. But I do know that Steve was absolutely adamant that no one other than Peter direct his shows. Well, is Peter allowed to work with anybody else? Well, he got offers for specials, things like that. But Steve always managed to make sure the deal fell through. You know this man? No, I don't. Why? He may be able to lead us to whoever switched that blank. Allison, is Sharon working? Yes, she is. She said she was with you the afternoon of the murder. Yeah, we were shopping. Am I to infer from that question that one or both of us are suspects? I had to ask. I guess I've never found a graceful way of doing it. Okay, Bobby, okay, Bobby, Bobby's family's already. We've got to go now. Okay, all right. Sure. Yes, Gene. Hang on. We got the talkie in there? Yeah, this turn on oh, We're coming. We're coming. Yeah. All right, let's get out of here, guys. Come on. You again? Get out. All right, but before I do, I want you to take a look at something. Get lost. You know, you'd be a whole lot less suspicious if you were just a little bit more cooperative. All right, man, here we go. And action. You better buckle up, boy. Take a look at, kid. You ever seen this guy? Nope. Figures. <laughs> thank you. You look terrible. Oh, thank you. So did he, uh, did he recognize the photograph? Michelle. How, how would you feel if you'd come inches from a cardiac arrest? Your life passes before you in the blink of an eye, and, and somebody runs up and asks for a story. Huh, I'd say that they were, you know, totally insensitive. You would? Yeah, and I'd offer to take them somewhere and buy them a drink. Really? Yeah. Totally off the record. All right. You're buying. Yep. Off the record. Steve Carr was a man like any other man, only richer. <laughs> he loved life, and now that he's gone, we're all a little bit poorer. In fact, uh, some of us are going to be a lot poorer. <laughs> but on a more serious note, most of you know that Steve and I went to college together. We had big dreams, most of which came true. Steve lived life fast and hard, and if it was short, it sure was fun. I miss you, Steve. We all do. Excuse me. Hello, Sharon. Your mother's arranged a very nice tribute. Well, the guest list needs more work, but on the whole, it's certainly more than he deserved. You know this man? No, I don't. 
And regardless of my feelings toward my stepfather, I really think it's a bit tacky of you to be on the job at a moment like this. They really have to excuse me. Any luck? It's the man in the picture. I wish I could have gotten a better hold on him. What's wrong with your hand? Nothing. When I grabbed him, something came off on my hand. Makeup. Green makeup. Green makeup. You all right? I told you we were going to get along. You mean we? You're the only one. All right. Let's go again. <clears throat> I got news for you, lady. I've been along for the ride all day. This is where I get off. I told you. What do you think, Paul? See something? Well, nothing that would make me want to steal it. And cut it! Hey, you all right? Are you okay, Kate? Um, could you just give me some ice? Give me, give me the minute, please. Okay. Well, if there's anything incriminating in this film, it's lost on me. I'd say our mystery man was given a bum steer. Let me, uh, let me take a look. Will you look at this? I think I have something. At least one of us has. Well, the makeup on that young man made me think that maybe, just maybe, he was an actor. I got this year's player's guide, and there he is. Dak Foster. Is there an address there? No, but his agent's listed. Okay, Paul. Track him down. <laughs> I'd better they're paying me big money. Sure, that'll make up for what you don't get here. <laughs> Were you a little nervous tonight? A little tense. Mm -hmm. you know, first time. Well, if it isn't Robert McKay, ladies and gentlemen, crashing yet another party. He, he, sh he shot him. Somebody call an ambulance. He shot Steve. That was an excerpt of the Steve Carr show that was broadcast the night of the murder. Is that correct? That is correct. We collected it as evidence that same night. I show People's Exhibit A, which has been confirmed by ballistics tests to be the murder weapon. Do you recognize that? Yes, it has my marks on it. Where did you find this weapon? Mr. McKay's car. After you found it, did you examine it? Yes. Did you find any blanks in this gun? No. Five live rounds and one expended one. Thank you. No further questions? Your witness? No questions. Let me step down. I don't get it. Why did he bring all that up? Because he knew I would. He must intend to discredit your story before I get the chance to present it. I called John P. Howell to the stand. Mr. Howell, you are the maitre d' at Archer's Restaurant, is that correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. Did you see Mr. McKay and Mr. Carr at the restaurant the night before the murder? Yes, sir. Did anything happen between them? Well, they got into a fight. 
fight. You mean they were arguing? No. Mr. Carr hit Mr. McKay. So you would say they appeared to be angry? Oh, yes. Mr. Carr hit Mr. McKay and knocked him down. Can you be sure they were angry? Perhaps they were just joking. Objection. Calls for speculation. Improper opinion. Sustained. No further questions. Witness. Mr. Howell, your clarity in recalling certain events the night before Mr. Carr's death is remarkable. Now, what about the night of his death? Did you see Mr. McKay that night? Oh, yes. I, uh, I showed him to a table. About what time was that? It was around 11.45. Since the Steve Carr show was broadcast live, that means Mr. McKay had just left the TV studio. What did Mr. McKay say to you? Well, he ordered a cocktail and then uh, he ordered dinner, the uh, Burgundy Duckling. Your memory is remarkable. Well, I remember because I told him it would take about a half an hour to prepare. A half hour? How did Mr. McKay respond? He said that would be all right and that he was in no hurry. So how would you describe his mood, Mr. Howell? Actually, he was, uh, he was quite pleasant, almost jovial. Would you say he was in a joking mood? Objection, move to strike, relevancy. Sustained. No further questions. You, you want me to give somebody else first crack at this kid? Fine, he's just gonna be the next Tom Cruise. Bozo. It's open. Mr. Freeman. Here. Fill this out, put your 8x10s on it. Do it out in the hall. I'll get back to you sometime. I'm Paul Drake. And I'm busy. You didn't return my call, so I thought I would come down here and speak to you personally. I'm thrilled. Now get out of here. Now look, it, I took time out of a very hectic schedule to come down here and talk to you about using one of your actors in my new series. Your, your new series? New York Heat? Oh, well, you must be... Uh... Paul Drake. Yes, I'm sorry, my uh, service didn't get the message to me. I'll fire them first thing in the morning. Please, sit. I'm, I'm sorry if I seemed rude, but my analyst recently died. You handle an actor by the name of Dak Foster. Oh, yes, fine boy. Fine actor. Delight to work with. I saw him in an off-Broadway play at one point. I'm thinking about centering my new series around an unknown. That's Dak. How can I reach him? Um, well, I'm afraid he's working. I have to see him today. Unfortunately, I'm heading back to L.A. on a 6 o'clock flight. Um, I'm afraid I just uh, can't reach him. Mr. Drake, Michelle Bendy, National Informer. I was wondering, sir, if I could ask you just a few quick questions. On? Have you what cast your series yet, and what kind of talent have you Why found here in New York City? Why don't you people leave me alone? How did you find out I was here? Now, wait a second. Did somebody in your agency tip her off? Is it true no. you're using one of Mr. Freeman's clients? Look, Freeman, nobody treats me this way. You want to publicize your agency? All right, come on, sweetheart. I'm going to give you a story about unethical practices. No, I'm innocent. I'm ethical, I swear. Then get rid of this person. Get out. Well, I was just now. a quick question. Come on. Please. Go. I'm sorry. It was a terrible misunderstanding. You've been offensive, uncooperative, and impolite. I think I'll let myself out. No, please. Wait. Here. Uh, this is the address you'll find Dak at in Queens. I'd take you myself, but my car was stolen. Mr. Freeman, thank you. <clears throat> Got it? Great, let's go. Shell, I can't take you with me. Taxi! What, what do you mean? Just what I said, I can't take you with me. Paul, I'm having a little bit of trouble understanding this deal we have here. It seems to me just a bit one-sided. I mean, I get you a picture of Doc, you use it to track down his agent, I help you with him, so what do I get? Michelle, I'm investigating a murder. I'm not covering a kidnapping by aliens in a UFO. You and I had a deal. And don't be so damn condescending. I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. Taxi! Uh, I can't take any more of this. Shell, this is just a story for you, is it not? Is that what you think? Paul, my editor is very hot for this story. I deliver and I get a big fat bonus and maybe finally I'm able to leave that rag. What, do you think I like working for the informer? This story is my chance to look for something better. 
Michelle, I like you. And I would like to be able to help you. So come on, let's go. Get in. You'll probably regret this. All right, Mr. Reston. What is all this about a surprise witness? Uh, Your Honor, I have requested this recess to ask for your and Mr. Mason's indulgence because I wish to call an additional witness to the stand. This morning, I was under the impression Mr. Reston had called his last witness. So was I. And I hate surprises, Mr. Reston. Your Honor, uh, this witness brought himself to the attention of my office less than an hour ago. And believe me, I was surprised to hear that he wishes to testify as you are. Just who is this witness? Eric Brenner. He was on location with the film crew the afternoon before the murder. Should I wonder what further surprises you have in store for us, Mr. Reston? Mr. Mason is entitled to be advised of all prosecution witnesses prior to trial, Mr. Reston. I would have expected you to be above such behavior. Your Honor, I am very sorry, and I'm well aware of how this must look. But I'm also convinced that this witness's testimony is very important to the people's case. Mr. Mason, you have every right to a continuance, and I have every intention of granting you one. Is that how you wish to proceed? Your Honor, if Mr. Reston has a great need and wishes to put Mr. Eric Brenner on the stand, Defense has no objection. And what did Mr. McKay do with the weapon after the prop man, Mr. Page, loaded it and gave it to him? He put it in his car, in the glove compartment, and then he went back to reshooting the scene. And did anyone go near the car after that? No, not a soul the whole rest of the afternoon. Why are you so sure? because we spent the next three and a half hours on the same shot. I, um, I spent the whole time right across the street from McKay's car. So, it was never out of your sight? No, sir. And no one went near it, let alone reach into the glove compartment to, say, exchange the alleged blank for a real bullet? No, sir. Thank you, Mr. Brennan. That's all. I have no questions, but I would like to reserve the right to recall the witness. All right, you may step down, Mr. Brenner. Does that mean you've got something in mind? Yep. I think he smiles too much. So, because Mr. McKay was wearing a radio mic, you could hear everything that he and the prop man, Mr. Page, were saying. Every word. And what were they saying, Miss Huntley? Well, basically Robert was saying he needed to borrow a prop gun. And Jed was saying no, he wasn't going to let him. But Mr. Page changed his mind. Once he found out why Robert wanted it. Why did he want it? So he could pretend to shoot Steve Carr on the show that evening. As a joke. A joke? Robert was actually going to fire a blank. He said he and Steve had it all planned. Objection. Move to strike. Hearsay. Sustained. Testimony is stricken. Mr. McKay was well known for his habit of playing practical jokes, was he not? There's nothing Robert and Steve love better than a good practical joke. That's all, Ms. Huntley. Thank you very much. Your witness, Mr. Reston. Had you worked with Robert McKay on any films prior to this one? Yes, several. Uh, during the making of those films, did he have occasion to wear a radio microphone? Certainly. They're quite common, especially in action films. So he would be familiar with their operation? Yes. Can't we assume that he would be completely aware that anyone standing next to the sound mixer could overhear everything he said? I object. Calls for speculation on part of the witness. Calls for complete conjecture. Mr. Mason, if you don't mind, I'd like to answer the question. Your Honor, 
I withdraw my objection. You're saying that because someone is accustomed to wearing a wireless microphone, we should assume that person is aware that people are listening in. Actually, quite the opposite is true. I'm so used to radio mics that I usually forget I'm wearing one. Or that people can hear me. Your Honor, I move to strike the witness's answer as non-responsive. I withdraw the question. Motion granted. Ms. Huntley, how far away were you standing from Robert McKay when you overheard him talking about this joke? I was across the street. So you could see him? Yes. Was there any indication that he could see you? He smiled at me. Which means that he saw you standing next to the sound mixer and saw you listening. That's all. No further questions. Not at all. Robert. Quiet. He might be shooting. Down, They're shooting. Oh, oh hell. Cut! Rick, get that thing out of there before it decapitates somebody. Oh, get me a space blanket. Uh, you, over here. Me? You, watch your work. Sit right over here. Hold this just about there. And don't let it down until I say cut. Hi. Okay, Rick, we've got Phil. Let's roll him. Take six. Do you know what time? And Foster. Cut. Welcome to the wonderful world of low-budget filmmaking. Where's Dak? He's right over there. You directed the Steve Carr show, did you not, Mr. Town? Yes, every night for 11 years. So you were directing the show the night he was shot? That's right. Mr. Town, did you know Robert McKay was going to make an appearance on the show that night? No, I did not. Your Honor, I have a number of important questions to ask of this witness. But first, I'd uh, like to set up a demonstration recreating the events of the murder right here in the courtroom. Wait a minute, Mason. Exactly what kind of a three-ring circus are you proposing we run here? What do you mean by we? So far, we've been subjected to your low, juggling carnival approach. Order! Now, we want to continue what on What exactly do you mean by we? Just one minute, both of you. Step up here. Ah, you gentlemen are forgetting something here. I make the arrangements here. I make the rulings, and I make the observations. Now, if what you're suggesting, Mr. Mason, is a motion for me to decide, why don't you make one? Your Honor, it is extremely important that the defense be allowed to demonstrate the actual circumstances of the crime. We're sure that the prosecution would have no objection to our search for the truth. We did not object when Mr. Reston suddenly wanted Eric Brenner put on the stand. Your Honor, I submit that that was a different case. Perhaps the esteemed counsel for the defense was so amenable at that point because he already had this little trick in mind. Perhaps. All right, let's put an end to all this. Mr. Mason, if you're representing that this is important to your case, I'll grant the request. I am, Your Honor. That'll be the order. Cut! Well, that wasn't bad, was it? Loved it. <laughs> all right, 30 minutes now. And that's all, because if we don't get the next shot by then, we're not going to get the next shot. And the producer's going to pull the plug, and you know what's going to happen to all those back salaries of yours. So let's go, let's move it, okay? How you doing? I'm Paul Drake. This is my girlfriend, Michelle Venti. 
Hi, how are you? Fine. Do I know you? I don't think so. Where, uh, where are you guys from? California. Oh, well, maybe I met you out there. What do you guys do? Uh, we're actors. Unemployed right now. Lots of that going around. Yeah, well, we heard you were making a movie here, and we thought maybe we could hustle a little work. Well, there's work, no money. And it's not exactly the kind of credit you'd want to put at the top of your bio, either. Well, thank God for makeup, huh? So what about the, uh, the Robert McKay shoot? What about it? Any work there? I wouldn't know. What do you mean he's not here? We have to shoot the scene where he kills the vampire now before they kick us out of here. It's the damn finale! What's the monster supposed to do? Keel over and die of a heart attack? What? What, Gordon didn't show up? He must have got that soap he was up for. Damn! Hey, Ron. My uh, friend here's an actor. Why don't you use him? No, yeah, that's, yeah, uh, that's an idea. We can, we can slap a wig on him. We can do some weird angle. I'm sure. I'm just down here, Ross. That's okay. Get this guy in wardrobe, okay? Come here. No, 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 really. I can't. I can't. Listen, I got three weeks worth of back pay that says you better, mister. Now, as you can see, this area represents Steve Carr and his guest. And here we have the curtain where Mr. McKay made his entrance. Is that clear? Yes. Now, those three X's represent the three cameras you use to take the Steve Carr show. If you would step down out of the witness box, I'd like you to explain to the court exactly how you use them. Step down. The first X represents camera one. What was it focused on? Camera one holds Steve Carr in a close-up. All the time? Yes. Now, that position there, what was it used for? Camera two is used for a wider two-shot of Steve and his guest. Did uh, that ever vary? No. And camera three? Camera three is called the swing camera. If someone performs or makes an appearance, it will hold the person from the curtain and then carry them all the way to their seat. Once the guest was seated, how was it used? It would then hold the guest in a close-up. And that was your normal procedure? I did it that way for 11 years. Then I can assume since Steve Carr's guest was already seated when Robert McKay came through the curtain, that camera one was a close-up of Mr. Carr, camera two was a two-shot of Mr. Carr and his guest, and camera three was a close-up of the guest. That's what you said, isn't it? Yes. Good. Now, let's look at the tape. Bailiff? Welcome, Marty, oh, welcome. Nice try. Thank you. Now, that is camera two. Oh, Steve, you're too kind. No, it's your first time. And that would be camera three. Thanks, Steve. Coming from you, that means something. Not much, but... Back to camera two. Okay, let's see if we can get in a subtle plug Great. for you. Here, I understand you're appearing the 12th through the 15th at the Melody Land Ballroom. I'd better than paying me big money. Were you a little nervous tonight? Freeze it, please. Mm -hmm. Now, Mr. Town, which one of these three cameras was taping Mr. McKay? How did any one of them anticipate Mr. McKay's entrance? Isn't it true it would be physically impossible for any one of them to swing over in time to catch his unexpected entrance through the curtain? You see, um... Yes. Water. Water. Isn't it true you would have to have had camera three in position to get that shot? Yes. Isn't it true you knew Robert McKay was going to make an appearance on the show that night? Yeah. Yeah. 
Steve. Uh, Steve told me that Robert McKay would be on the show. He told me about the gun, the joke, everything. You may return to the stand, Mr. Town. You were very close to Steve Carr, were you not? Yes, very close. Isn't it true that you were recently offered an important directing assignment in Los Angeles? Yes. Isn't it true that Steve Carr prevented you from accepting that assignment? We were having a contract dispute. Which he won? Yes. How did you feel about that? I didn't like it. One more question. How would you characterize him when he told you Mr. McKay was going to be on the show? Did he seem frightened, apprehensive? No. Isn't it true that you lied about that because you didn't want to be suspected of putting that live ammunition in Robert McKay's gun? Mr. Town, isn't it true you lied about that? Yes. Thank you. No further questions. Mr. Resson. Mr. Town. As fond as you were of Steve Carr, and uh, being familiar with the stormy friendship with Mr. McKay, weren't you apprehensive when you heard that McKay was going to appear on the show? Carrying a gun? Yes, in fact, I was. Yes, I should think so. Thank you. Witness may step down. The court will recess until this afternoon at 2.30. Uh, Your Honor, uh, defense would like a one-hour extension to examine new evidence. We can do better than that, Mr. Mason. The court will adjourn until tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. What new evidence? Robert. How many cameras are used when you're shooting a scene? Well, we use one, two, sometimes more of, uh, if we're shooting a stunt. A stunt? Mm -hmm. That's what you were doing all the while that gun was in your car. Shooting a stunt. Yes, I have it, thank you. This isn't the same film we saw before. Well, it's the same scene shot by a second camera in slow motion. Is it the film that was stolen? It would have been if Dak Foster had known there was a second camera. Well, I don't see anything incriminating in this one either. Robert, could we look at that again? Just the last part. Sure, why, well, you see something? Yeah. Della, where's Paul? Oh, that was Paul on the phone. Okay, Paul, you ready for a tape? Yeah, Come on, please. All right, this is it. MOS, let's roll them. And action! See if you can catch me now.
Brenner, would you please describe for the court what happened in the scene they were shooting that afternoon during the time Robert McKay's car was not out of your sight? Sure. It was uh, a stunt in which a car tries to run over the characters that Robert and Kate play. They roll out of the way, it bangs into a parked car and drives off. Did it involve using doubles? It wasn't necessary. It was a fairly minor stunt. And in the course of this minor stunt, Ms. Huntley suffered a minor injury, is that correct? She hurt her ankle during one of the takes. She was treated by the nurse on the set, Mrs. Brenda Saunders. Is that correct? Matter of fact, she was. Mrs. Saunders, would you please stand? Now, you insisted on carrying Miss Huntley over to the nurse. Is that correct, Mr. Brenner? Yes. Thank you. And you insisted on staying with Miss Huntley while the nurse applied ice to her ankle, a process which took over five minutes. Is that correct, Mr. Brenner? Yes. And you still contend that not once, not once during that time, did you take your eyes off Robert McKay's car? Of course I took my eyes off it, but only for a moment. Over five minutes, Mr. Brenner. Over five minutes. Over five long minutes. That's all, sir. You may step down, Mr. Brenner. I call Mr. Joseph DeVito to the stand. Now, this is the footage you shot when you were operating the second camera that day, Mr. DeVito. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. That is correct. Mr. DeVito... Who are these people? Uh, just spectators, you know, people who come down because they uh, want to see how a movie's shot, I guess. When I had this footage transferred onto tape, I had them enlarge this frame because there's something peculiar about one of those people. Yeah, I see what you mean. Uh, everyone seems to be facing forward except for that one person right there. Yes, that person has turned away. Now, look closely. What do you see? Uh, just that it's a woman. Mr. DeVito. Stop. You don't have to go any further. I did it. Order! Further demonstrations of this sort, and I will have this courtroom cleared. I took the blank from the gun, and I replaced it with a real bullet. Your Honor. Your Honor. I call Allison Carr to the stand. Mrs. Carr, did you kill your husband? Yes, I did. You went to the movie set where Robert McKay was filming and put a live round of ammunition in his revolver? Yes, I did. Why did you kill your husband? Because I hated him. Why did you hate him? Do you want us to believe it was because you wanted a divorce? And he was unwilling to give you a satisfactory financial settlement? Yes. Do you want us to believe it was because he was worth more to you dead than alive? Yes. And then you'd inherit all his money? Yes. Is that the real motive for this murder? Mrs. Carr, are you aware that the penalty for premeditated murder under circumstances such as these is punishable by life imprisonment? I am. And that if you are convicted, you may spend the greater part of your life in prison? Please stop this. She's trying to protect me. You know I did it, don't you? Yes. And you know I'm going to have to put you on the stand. Your Honor, 
At this time, I call Sharon Loring. I first met Steve Carr when I was 17, when he married my mother. On the day of the wedding, he tried to seduce me. He tried several times after that, which is why I decided to go to school in Europe, to get away. Did you tell your mother? No, I never told her. I didn't want to hurt her. When was the last time you saw Steve Carr? On the day that he was murdered, he called and he asked me to lunch. I didn't want to go, but he said that uh, he wanted to make up for the past, that he wanted to help me with my career. So when I got to his apartment, he was laughing about the stunt that he was going to pull on the show. And that's when he told me about Robert McKay. Then what happened? He tried to seduce me again. Except this time he wasn't going to take no for an answer. He, uh, he hit me and he tore up my clothes. And I fought back. But then he said that it, it, if I didn't come across, that he would tell my mother that we'd done it anyway and that she'd think I was a tramp. So I ran away. What did you do when you left the apartment? I walked around for a while, and then I went to the movie set. I, I can't remember how I got there. But I stayed in the crowd, and then I saw Robert McKay put the prop gun in the glove compartment. So I went to the store, and I bought some real bullets. And then when everybody was taking care of Kate Huntley, I exchanged the blanks for real bullets. Miss Loring, why are you stepping forward at this time? When you showed my mother the picture of my boyfriend, Dak, she came to me and I told her everything. Today she's trying to protect me and I can't let her do that. Steve Carr ruined my mother's life. I killed him and I'm not sorry that I did. <clears throat> well, this has been a most involved matter. But the truth seems to have become self-evident. The court will entertain a motion, Judge. Mr. Reston. Your Honor, the people move for a dismissal. Case dismissed. Well, you finally got your story. I sure did. And what do you get? An evening with you? That'll be my story. Uh-huh. And for once, it'll just be the two of us. Thank you. You ready? Yeah. 